Uh, Stephen, thank you, and uh, thank you all for coming today and for watching online. Uh, I'm a geologist by training, and so it may be a little odd to be speaking at a health conference, but I hope that by the time that I'm done with the talk today and then the talk tomorrow on the, the dirt book, uh, that you'll sort of see why a geologist would look at the kind of issues that I've been talking about. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the story behind a new book that's coming out in the fall called The Hidden Half of Nature, The Microbial Roots of Life and Health, and it's a book that my wife, Anne Clay, wrote with me. She's a biologist by training who got into the public health field, and I'm a geologist, as has been mentioned several times now. Why would we write a book that sort of focuses on microbes? That's what I want to get at today, because I think that we're actually, you don't have many opportunities to live through a scientific revolution. And I think we're actually doing that today in terms of our view of the role of microbial life and its effects on the nature that we know. Anne and I were trained as naturalists, people who looked at the macroscopic world of nature. We looked at rocks, we looked at plants and animals, the kind of things that you tend to get in geology and biology. But this, the journey that we went through over the last decade or so that led us to actually realize the fundamental importance of microbial life, what we call the hidden half of nature, these guys here uh, on the screen now, to the macroscopic world of nature that we know uh, is actually leading us, I think, to the new way of thinking, a new way of looking at our nature and ourselves that promises to actually bring new perspectives to the worlds of agriculture and medicine two sort of branches of human endeavor that we all care about and depend on. Uh, so what I want to do today is give you sort of the, the journey through our intellectual evolution, if you will, uh, I'm coming to those kind of conclusions. And so in terms of introducing the characters I'll talk today, I'm not going to show you a whole lot of pictures of microbes. They're at, they, after all, are invisible. Um, they're, they're hard to photograph. Uh, but these are some nice color illustrations of archaea and bacteria, fungi, viruses, and protists. These are all unicellular um, microscopic organisms that if you, their ecological relationships, both to one another and to the larger world of nature that we know, turn out to be far more fundamental and important in ways that actually enhance and bolster the health of plants and people than either Anne or I were taught in our education. And that's what I, the, the, if there's one point that I want to try and get across to you today, it's that key point, and we're going to walk you through essentially how we got there. Uh, so if we look at the, the visible and the invisible worlds of nature, the, the, the visible half and the hidden half of nature, and we sort of characterize it on a graph like this where we go in um, sort of cycles of powers of 10, from DNA down there at, at the left-hand side, at the, the root of life, all the way to you know, the meter or two scale for people, you'll notice that the difference in size between, say, a virus and a red blood cell is comparable to the difference in size between a ladybug and a person. And that there's this whole universe of, of invisible life at a size that we don't tend to recognize. And this is just to give you sort of a, a, a hint at the sort of the eight or nine orders of magnitude of scale difference that go between the microbial world and the world of nature that we're familiar with and that we know and can experience in our own lives, that we can like bash a piece off of if we're a geologist or, or study as a biologist. How did we actually come to the recognition of the fundamental uh, importance of the role of microbial life in our own lives? Well, it happened in a fairly unusual way. It happened because we bought an old house with a ratty lawn in North Seattle. Um, this is a picture of our house from the back of the assessor's office back in the 1930s. Um, and as you can see, essentially, there's not much in the way of plants in the yard. Back in the 1930s, it was essentially a lawn that was probably planted about 1918 when the house was built. And when we bought the house uh, in the late 1990s, that lawn was still there. Um, not much had changed. And if you dug into that lawn, essentially you wouldn't find any worms. There was, there was, ver there was very little life actually in that, um, in that lawn. And this was not acceptable to my gardener wife. Um, the, you can give any plant to me, I'm a geologist, and within about a, a, a month, it'll probably be dead. I'll forget to water it. I have a brown thumb. Anne has a green thumb. She's a plant whisperer. She can make almost any plant happy. And this was not her idea of the ideal yard. Um, I liked it in a way because, it, you know, I could throw a tennis ball for our dog Zena to, to, to chase across the yard. It kind of worked. I could get my grad students over to play croquet on it. But for Anne, this was a really big problem. This was not what she wanted in the yard. And she started thinking about, well, what would her dream garden be? How would you actually sort of change this yard and make it something that a gardener would really appreciate? Um, the kind of uh, garden that would actually enhance our experience in our lives and keep her busy and happy on the weekends and after work and so forth. So she started to essentially uh, plan and scheme, uh, you know, 
taking photographs of the house, looking at other people's yards and trying to figure out what kind of things would we bring in and actually try and use to enhance our yard. Well, once we got the plans together and we hired a guy with a bulldozer to come in and essentially scrape that lawn off and get back to bare soil, we discovered that we had a problem on our hands. When we bought the house, there were a few things that we needed to do, like remodel the kitchen, and, but it was in decent shape for a 100-year-old house. What we didn't realize is that we also had fixer-upper dirt. Um, when we took the lawn off, you'll notice that there's not much in the way of organic matter. It's not very brown. It's not black soil. It basically looks sort of tan. What this was is essentially glacial till. Uh, we live in North Seattle. It's an area where the glaciers ran, a large glacier ran over it between about 17 to 15,000 years ago, scraped all the topsoil that had been there off. When it retreated, it was bare soil. Uh, it took thousands of years for the forest to actually rebuild a fertile topsoil that then supported one of the, the richest biomasses per unit area on the planet, with some of the, the native forests of the Pacific Northwest. And then when Seattle was developed, we scraped it all off all over again, right back down to bare till, and started over just as if the glaciers had just left. Uh, so when we scraped off the lawn, we basically found that we didn't have much life in the soil. It was um, a big problem. How was Anne going to actually make a very nice garden out of this absolutely wretched dirt? Well, she took it in her mind to actually uh, restore the soil in our yard by adding organic matter. Her gut told her that, they, and that is a pun relative to where we're going, by the way. Uh, what her gut told her was that um, you know, the, the, the soil needed organic matter. It needed, um, it needed carbon, it needed life, uh, and she took it on herself to essentially undergo a campaign to try and bring organic matter back to the yard. What kind of stuff did she actually use to do that? Well, she used a mix of uh, essentially what we can call brown goods and green goods, uh, carbon-rich sources, leaves, uh, um, wood chips, things that served as mulch on the surface of the, of the soil. She would gather things like oak leaves from, uh, um, from neighbors who were like, quite happy to have her uh, rake them up and cart them away instead of whatever they would do with them. Uh, people who, uh, you know, arborists who would be chipping trees in the neighborhood or trimming things, we would arrange that they could uh, dump them on our driveway. Um, we could then mulch part of the yard. Um, that was where she got the brown goods, the carbon-rich sources. Uh, in terms of the green goods, the source of nitrogen, uh, that was essentially things that were growing in the yard, uh, things that were um, live goods that we essentially, that she then mixed. And she experimented with creating different mulches and compost mixes, um, following sort of a composter's rule of thumb of using about 20 to 30 parts of carbon-rich stuff to one part of nitrogen-rich stuff. Um, she also, though, experimented with having living things. Uh, in terms of that picture in the upper left is essentially uh, coffee grounds that, uh, you know, living in Seattle, there's a, a large supply of coffee shops that are more than happy to let you take their coffee grounds. Uh, it's a very rich source of nitrogen. Um, you know, we won't talk very much about whether it makes any sense to take coffee grown in the tropics and use it to restore your yard in Seattle, because no, it makes no sense. But it was free and it was available. And it worked very well in conjunction with worm compost down there in the lower left-hand corner that came out of, our, uh, out of our kitchen scraps. And the thing that really, I thought when she started doing it, didn't make a lot of sense to me, but in hindsight was really the key thing was she got into applying soil soup to the yard, essentially a microbial brew where um, uh, it was intended to, to, uh, to add beneficial microbes uh, to the plant surfaces, to the soil, uh, as a way to stimulate soil life. And my original uh, thinking of that was like, well, how could adding a bunch of these invisible microbes sort of do much good to restoring the soil? Well, it turns out it did an awful lot of good, um, far more than I ever imagined. Um, I was writing the book I'll be talking about tomorrow, Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations. I was writing that during the time when Anne was restoring the soil to our yard. Um, and so I was sitting in the living room writing about how society after society had quite literally plowed themselves out of business or degraded their soil to the point where other things um, then took them out of business. And yet here she was turning that problem around in our yard through the application of organic matter and microbial life uh, to our yard. This shows you our soil about five, six years into the project. Uh, you'll notice the, the leaves and mulch up at the top. And down at the bottom, of, uh, at the base of her pruning shears there, uh, you'll notice that tan stuff. That's back down into that original uh, really crappy soil that we had. Um, but notice that layer on top. She's got a couple inches of fairly rich, or a lot richer than it was, brown topsoil. Um, in other words, she was able to build a couple inches of soil in way less than a decade. And if you look at what I'll talk about tomorrow in terms of the pace of soil formation under natural circumstances, this is screamingly fast. Uh, nature makes it, takes about 500 years to make an inch of topsoil, and did a couple, years, a couple inches in less than a decade.
What did it do? Well, the, uh, bringing life back to the soil in our yard basically resulted where, you know, in less than a decade, a uh, little more than the five years I was just talking about, uh, the garden started to look like this. Uh, so an explosion of life above ground, flowers, trees, vegetable beds that were put in. Uh, you know, this looks nothing like, this is getting back to what Anne wanted in a garden. Um, and I never imagined that we actually could, that she could turn our, the, the yard that we bought the house with into something that looked like this in less than a decade. And that really spurred my interest and curiosity in terms of what it was that was actually driving the show. And it turns out that you don't really see the action. We, we saw the action above ground in terms of the plants uh, that, were, um, that thrived in the yard. But what was driving the action was a lot of the action underground, the denizens of the dirt. Um, things that you can see are things like arthropods, worms, mollusks, yes, snails, uh, not necessarily all good life, uh, but the stuff that's hardly visible to you are things like nematodes and mites, those little sort of red dots that you can see run around in the, the yard at some point. But it turns out the very small, and the very, very small, protozoans, bacteria and fungi, those, those key players in the hidden half of nature, were the things that were really driving the show in terms of restoring life to the soil and the processing of nutrients and elements that actually then got taken up by the plants to support the explosion of life that we experienced and enjoyed above ground. Now, if you look at how much life there is in the soil, I mean, just because we can't see it doesn't mean there isn't a lot there. Um, you know, if you look at about a teaspoon of soil, there's something like 60 million bacteria in it. I'm sorry, 600 million. It's easy when you talk about numbers that large to sort of leave a zero off every now and then. It's still a big number. 600 million, twice as many people as there are in the United States. There's that many bacteria in a teaspoon of soil. The microbial world is incredibly rich. Um, there's something like you know, a couple hundred meters of fungal biomass in each teaspoon of soil with 5,000 species uh, in a, a, a teaspoon of healthy soil. 10,000 protozoa, 20 to 30 beneficial nematodes. Um, you know, the abundance and diversity of life in the soil is actually mind-boggling. There's this whole universe of life that exists at a scale that we don't perceive that actually has a big influence on the world we do walk around in and perceive and experience every day. Well, so you can see the soil life with which most gardeners are actually pretty familiar. Um, there's the earthworms. When we started um, the project in our yard, uh, I could dig a hole in the yard and we would not find a single worm. Six years later, if I dug in the yard, I'd find sort of thick, rich, brown worms that if you accidentally cut through one, and yes, I'm afraid to say I actually did that on occasion, you would get a whiff of espresso grounds. Um, <laughs> they were, had caffeinated worms plowing the yard. Um, pill bugs, ground beetles, millipedes, slugs, and spiders. I mean, that's the life that we can actually sort of see and experience on a um, regular basis when we went out in the yard. And we sort of saw those things come in in a defined order. The spiders, the arthropods came in, for, well, the worms and the arthropods, the spiders came in first, and then the beetles, um, and then birds came in to actually pull the worms out of the lawn, and then bigger birds came in to take the birds that were actually getting the worms out of the lawn. We saw this progression of life come back to the yard that we hadn't really expected. It culminated in raccoons and then a drunk that slept under the tree in the front yard once the trees are big enough to hide on a Saturday night. Um, but the, the part that we couldn't see of life in our yard, uh, that hidden half, uh, the microbial world, it turns out we think was actually really sort of running the show and driving things. Um, and it was that application of bringing that part of life back to the yard that really transformed the visible part and made the, the garden such a wonderful part of, of my life today that I, didn't really, that I hadn't imagined that it could be when Anne started on the garden restoration project. Um, well, so what is it, how is it that microbial life is really driving, the, driving this uh, ship? Well, soil bacteria and fungi really break down organic matter, and that's the, found, the foundation for building fertile soil that su supported the explosion of life above ground. Um, basically, you can think of the tiniest of life forms, um, those, those microbes, as nature's recyclers. They're breaking down the organic matter, those plants and the wood chips, um, um, the coffee grounds uh, that were and added to the soil on the surface as compost, they were breaking it down, integrating that into the soil, and turning it into forms of materials that plants could then take up and reuse. If you just put wood chips out without anything to break them down, a plant is uh, it's all locked up. A plant's not going to be able to access that stuff. You get a bunch of fungi out there starting to break down those wood chips, and it turns out that that's starting to turn into materials plants can use, 
And the more we looked into the life in the soil, the more we realized how there's actually specialized connections and adaptations between microbial life and plants that go well beyond simply breaking down and recycling stuff. So what happens to the microbes themselves? Well, bacteria and fungi are actually very nutrient-rich themselves. In putting their bodies together, they pull nutrients out of the mineral soil, they pull them out of rocks, um, and they're very nitrogen-rich, they're, they're very rich sources of, of many nutrients, and they in turn get eaten. They're the base of the soil food web. And it turns out the tiny worm-like nematodes, and don't tell a nematode researcher that their things are worms, they get really upset about that, so we'll just call them worm-like things, because to me they look like worms. Um, and that one in the lower left-hand corner there is actually sitting there eating a bacteria. Um, little microarthropods uh, and nematodes graze on soil bacteria and fungi, and those creatures sort of one leg up on the soil food web in turn excrete the remains of their processed meals, and that micro manure is incredibly rich in the kinds of nutrients that plants can then take up. So it's this system of having microbial life that's breaking down organic matter, then get turned into food for other organisms whose excrement essentially is very rich in terms of building the fertility of the soil. And that whole av angle and avenue in terms of a, bi of a biological driver for soil fertility is not something that I learned in college or graduate school in my training as a geologist, and I did take classes in soils. Um, and we m mostly learned that you know, the, the sources of plant nutrition were you know, carbon from the air, uh, oxygen from the water that gets mixed in photosynthesis to build their bodies. Uh, nitrogen is also taken from the air, but indirectly through microbial helpers, as we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, and then there's the breakdown of rocks where the mineral nutrients that also are needed to grow healthy plants and to build healthy bodies for animals uh, would come from the breakdown of rocks and conversion into soil and the gradual breakdown and weathering of the soil. But there's this other loop, that sort of green loop over there on the left-hand side of the screen, of what happens to organic matter. Uh, in terms of the organic matter that's produced by uh, vegetation, whether it's the leaves on trees that fall onto the surface of the soil, or whether it's the roots in grassland that decay beneath the soil, that stuff is very rich in the nutrients that are needed to make new life for a very simple reason. It was life. And essentially recycling that is a source of, of fertility in soils that, that is essentially one of the, was for a long time, I think sort of one of the, the great neglected sources of fertility in terms of agricultural applications, but it's one of the reasons why um, fresh native soils were so highly productive in so many parts of the world. They're full of organic matter. And how does this work? Well, soil life recycles organic matter uh, into the building blocks for new life, really through what I like to call the original underground economy. I know Anne doesn't like that term quite as much as I do, so if you're watching on the web, forgive me, I used it. Um, what organic matter does, though, um, is if it goes into the, the, the top of the soil, it, at, at, it serves essentially as an elixir for hungry soil biota that start to break it down and convert uh, that material that was in that organic matter um, into goodies that can actually be taken up by plants, um, and that microbial life that's supported thereby also can help break down, um, break down primary minerals in the rocks. Uh, they can scavenge phosphorus, for example. Fungi are very good at pulling phosphorus out of certain kinds of rocks and bringing that into biological circulation. That kind of phosphorus won't show up in a typical soil test, though, because it's locked up in a rock. You need a microbe to actually liberate it and get it into the cycle of fertility. Um, so that the, the, or the nutrients that are liberated from organic matter and from rock minerals by microbes then are, off, are to our surprise, we found they're involved in exchanges and deals with plants. Um, there's this whole sort of exchange of nutrients that goes on in the world below ground that actually makes the life of the soil essentially and the health of it inseparable from the health and the life of both plants and then the people who eat plants um, or people who eat the things that eat plants. Um, everything, in other words, the health of the world of the nature, the nature that we know around us, is connected very intimately to the health of the, the microbial world, the hidden half of nature, in the earth beneath our feet. Now, I, I mentioned that I would talk about nitrogen a moment ago. This, this is a picture of, of Anne's hand uh, holding a, um, um, a, a plant with the roots, uh, where there's little nodules that you see on it. Those little nodules are nodules that contain nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Uh, and you've probably heard about, about um, this, this phenomenon. Um, it's an example of a symbiosis in which the plant essentially creates an environment in which those microbes live, where they essentially get nutrition and they, they essentially in turn crank out nitrogen 
for the plants. Why is that important? Well, because nitrogen is one of the limiting elements for plant growth, and yet we're bathed in nitrogen, what, 78 or so percent of the atmosphere that we're breathing right now is made out of nitrogen, but it's a very stable molecule. The N2 molecule, it takes a lot of energy to crack uh, into nitrogen that can be biologically useful. Microbes, who have an incredible genetic repertoire and diversity, as we'll talk a bit more about later, um, have th certain microbes have the ability to crack atmospheric nitrogen and bring it into the biological world. Uh, and plants and microbes have formed symbiotic partnerships in which some populations of those microbes live intimately related with plant roots, and they essentially trade sugar for nitrogen. What is it that plants can actually do that nothing else really can? Well, except that some, some bacteria now, um, they can photosynthesize, they have carbon factories. They essentially can print money for the underground economy. And they trade it to microbes for things that they need, like nitrogen or phosphorus. There's a zone around the roots of plants called the rhizosphere that you may know about, you may have heard about, may be new to you, but it's full of microbes, uh, microbial life, uh, bacteria and fungi. And I was really surprised in doing the research for this book to, to learn that plants actually leak a substantial amount of the carbon or the carbohydrates, the, the sugary compounds that they generate through photosynthesis. They leak a surprising amount of that out through their roots into the soil. Why would they do that? You know, why would a farmer essentially take a, you know, a quarter to a third of their crop and go put it out by the highway for anybody to take? It just makes no sense. Unless you're essentially using it. Someone said compost, I think, if I'm hearing right. And that's on the right track. I mean, they're basically, what they're doing is they're basically exuding, because cause we call these compounds exudates, because they exude out of the roots. They're feeding the microbes in the rhizosphere. They're basically trying to attract populations of beneficial microbes. They wouldn't do this if it was bad for them. Or at least, you know, they would be selected, there'd be strong negative selection pressures in an evolutionary sense if they were feeding the pathogens. So they're basically leaking out exudates, exudates to create a living halo of beneficial microorganisms around their root system. Um, this is something, you know, I wasn't taught in college. It was sort of a, this is, I think this is the kind of discovery over the last couple decades that is really changing the way we see and think about microbial life. In many ways, they're essentially the secret silent partners of the plant world and, as we'll see, in terms of the animal world as well. So the rhizosphere is a zone that's rich with microbial life. It's got many times the density of, li of microbial life than the area, than soil outside of the rhizosphere. And it forms this living halo around plants. And what happens in there? Well, you can kind of think about it, if you want, as a biological bazaar. It's a place where there's all kinds of exchanges happening, uh, where plants are trading nutrients in exchange for microbial metabolites, where they trade exudates for microbial waste products. It's a kind of, it really is sort of a win-win a situation where the things that plants need, microbes can provide as their waste products, and plants who have these sugar factories on board in terms of chloroplasts in their leaves, which, by the way, used to be independent free-living microbes, as we'll get back to, um, that produce sugar for them. They trade that in exchange for what the microbes can produce. Um, so fungal hyphae over there, shown in the upper left, uh, are actually very good at scavenging nutrients out of the soil. And I mentioned phosphorus. There's certain um, um, mycorrhizae that are very good at going out and just bringing phosphorus back and trading it to plants. Um, Microbial metabolites uh, can serve uh, uh, major roles in, uh, in plant health, um, including, surprisingly, um, keying in and changing plant response, plant defense systems. If you think about, well, I didn't imagine before I was starting to work on this book that, you, that when above ground pests attack plants, those plants can release chemical signals in their exudates into the soil that essentially trigger microbes in the soil to in turn generate metabolites that the plant uses to help defend itself against those predators. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's not what I was taught in my soil science class. <laughs> um, so you have this communication going on between the plants and the, and the microbes that they are subsidizing with their sugary exudates. There's this back and forth signaling and communication. If you think about what kind of an immune system, a defense system, does a plant have? And I know I shouldn't use the immune system for a plant, but I did that on purpose. What kind of a defense system does a plant have? They're stuck in place. They don't move around. 
they, can actually, they basically take advantage of the wider genetic repertoire of soil life to essentially trade compounds they can make for compounds that come in handy for them as long as they keep those beneficial microbes around and living in the rhizosphere. This is an example of a symbiosis, um, of a win-win situation where two different species, co in effect, cooperate, each pursuing their own interest, but generating a, a more beneficial um, system. You might think about that in the way that, like, um, you know, villages uh, are symbioses between people, um, where we can specialize in doing different things. I can be a geologist, you can do whatever you do, um, and together we build a bigger society. This is a kind of those kind of uh, interchanges uh, and processes happen in between plants and microbes as well. You can also look at what happens if you take away the need for plants to generate their exudates. If you look at different um, differences in fertilization, for example, it can affect the style and material with which you fertilize plants can affect root growth and thereby affect the production of plant exudates, um, which influences in turn the, the microbial life in the rhizosphere and the density of microbial life in the rhizosphere. Um, and so if you look in that the figure that we're showing here, um, if you look in the, on the left-hand side, it's sort of an abstract plant root uh, under uh, no, these are uh, roots taken from um, uh, tomato plants, if I recall correctly, um, that show the example of the root system that develops with, with no fertilizer. In the middle, it's conventional nitrogen-rich fertilizer. Um, and you'll notice that you don't get quite the root density. Well, if, if a plant doesn't have to work very hard to actually acquire the nutrients that it needs, the nitrogen that it needs for growth, it puts less energy into root growth and it exudes less of those microbe-supporting compounds into the soil. You get a relatively depauperate rhizosphere or, just, or a less diverse rhizosphere in those situations. Over on the right, if you're using composted manure, well, it stimulates microbial growth. You get a much richer rhizosphere, you know, much, um, a much denser root network and a richer rhizosphere. In other words, the nature of what plants eat, if we can talk about plants eating, which I will do, so I might as well talk, I will talk more about that, so I will talk about that. Um, if we can think about what plants eat, what they actually have in terms of their nutrient sources actually matters to their growth, their health, and their relationship with their microbes, which is where the relationship with people and our microbes will come back in, in a little bit. So if we look at the rhizosphere in plants, um, they're really rich in mycorrhizal fungi that serve as an extension to the roots of the plant. You can think of the fungi as essentially uh, hair extensions for, for plant roots, if you will. They can actually reach, except ones that can actually reach out and bring things back to you. So science fiction hair extensions. Um, and what they'll do is they, the, those mycorrhizal fungi will forage for nutrients that they then can um, scavenge, bring back into the rhizosphere, and release and trade with plants uh, for, you guessed it, exudates. Um, what does that do for plants? Well, it really can enhance their uh, uptake of minerals, things that we need as micronutrients, things we want in crops, um, and they can enhance the, the uptake of basic nutrients and micronutrients as well. So essentially, they, and they also can provide for the, the chemical signaling and exchanges that influence plant growth. Some of the microbial, um, the microbial um, metabolites that are generated from either exudates or from the processing of organic matter, the other source of nourishment and nutrients to, to microbes, can actually boost plant growth. They, they can, some of these microbes are producing plant growth promoting hormones that plants need. You know, that, plant, that microbes are producing hormones to promote plant growth, that's not taught in Basic Fertilizer 101. The other thing that really surprised me as a geologist, though, is that when I looked back at the order in which life came back to our yard, it looked kind of familiar to me. It's kind of the same order in which life evolved on Earth. That's, that graph over there on the left-hand side shows you essentially the order in which life evolved on Earth. So on the terrestrial part of Earth, we're leaving the, I know the oceans cover most of the world, and oceanographers will object to this, but I'm gonna leave the oceans aside. We can call that the cradle of life. When life came onto land, um, what order did it happen? Well, bacteria and fungi arrived first. The microbes arrived first, started colonizing it. They um, worked on the surface. Uh, algal and bacterial mats uh, are recorded in sort of the first fossil soils from about 480 some odd million years ago back in the, the Ordovician period. Land plants arrived next in the, Sil in the Silurian. And arthropods, things that broke down um, land plants. 
the first insect detritivores, the first non soil dwelling, uh, well, the first insect detritivores arrived in the Devonian about 420 million years ago, at a time when giant mushrooms dominated the landscape. Mushrooms that got to be like 20 feet tall were, were huge, uh, the, the kind of the you know, land of the lost kind of, kind of uh, science fiction view stuff. Uh, there was a time when that was there. Uh, in the Carboniferous, you get the first insect herbivores, the first insects above ground that actually started eating plants. Um, you get ferns and seed-bearing plants. You then got uh, reptiles and conifers. Um, the first dinosaurs. Well, we didn't have any dinosaurs come back in our yard. I'll admit that. I was kind of disappointed. But um, well, maybe upon reflection, I'm pretty happy that none came. Um, but then mammals and birds, and then finally us. I mean, you look at that list, and that same order is basically the order in which life came back in our yard as we watched it come in over the course of about a decade, culminating in that that drunk that I probably shouldn't have mentioned. Um, but the the, the take-home message that we took from this was essentially that it was kick-starting the microbial life below ground that reset the foundation for all that followed. That the foundation for terrestrial life is actually in the hidden half of nature in the part of life below ground. And the thing that we'll sort of follow up on this with in terms of looking at the importance of this for human health is that if you think about the partners that all the different steps in the evolutionary history of life would have had along the way. Microbes were there. We've never been sanitized. Our ancestors were never clean or free of microbes. There were partnerships that were forged in the fires of deep time, in the evolutionary fires of long periods of time, that actually shaped the development of things like the human immune system, like the plant defense system, the things that keep plants and people healthy, actually have been tuned over incredibly long periods of time through the interaction with the microbial world, with the hidden half of nature. Now, the whole history of life, as we're starting to learn, is sort of wrapped up in relationships with microbial life. But we didn't even know that microbes existed until the 17th century. Uh, and Antony von Leeuwenhoek, this gentleman uh, here shown in his resplendent robe, uh, was the guy who discovered microbes. He was a Dutch draper. Uh, he, he got really interested in, in microscopes because he wanted to be able to examine the fibers that made up the linens that he sold. And his hobby turned into creating microscopes. Uh, so he invented sort of the, the best microscopes of his day. And Lo and behold, in a um, sample of pond water that he had uh, sampled, he discovered th these you know, small things swimming around in a forest of, of small plants. He considered microbes marvelous curiosities. He called them wee beasties. Uh, he thought maybe they did some things, but that they, wasn't, they weren't really thought to be all that important for one simple reason. They were really small. I mean, you couldn't see them. We didn't even know that they were there. How could something that was invisible, so tiny, actually do anything important at all. It just did not make sense in his day. Um, it took several centuries after Leon Hook's astounding discoveries for scientists to start really thinking that microbes did anything of much interest. It wasn't until the 19th century that uh, people started to realize, oh, it's microbes that actually fermented beer and wine. Maybe they were useful after all. <laughs> um, or that they actually were the root of some diseases. Maybe they weren't so good after all. Um, and in 2015, Brian Ford built some replicas of Leeuwenhoek's Hook's microscopes. There's a photograph of, of one of his that shows you uh, the kind of things that Leeuwenhoek Hook would have seen down there at the bottom. But the point there is that it took a long time after we recognized that microbes actually existed to come to the conclusion that they did much of any importance. If we fast forward to today, we actually know that if we look at the kind of sort of modern tree of life, uh, that has resulted from genetic sequencing, it shows that microbes are actually sort of dominate the tree of life. Um, this shows Carl Woese's famous figure from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences from 1990, where you can see the sort of the branching structure, um, as he put it, of the tree of life, where bacteria over there in blue, uh, archaea, which are also single-celled things that would look just like bacteria to you and I, but have a different composition and structure. Um, are two of the three main branches of, of life. The eukarya over there, the sort of the, the animals that have uh, nuclei and that uh, well, all sort of multicellular life arose from is over there on that side. Everything, every branch in that tree that has an M, a star, or a C, everything that's just a letter, those are microbes. Notice that plants, fungi, and animals, the three the parts of nature that we tend to know of as nature, are just three little branches over on the right-hand side, and people would be this tiny little twig over on the corner of the animals. Um, so the world of life as we know it is dominated by microbial life. 
They are, they are incredibly diverse genetically. Their ability to do things in terms of their, their um, genetic repertoire, their ability to make, to make things, to change things, to transform things, to break things down, turn them into useful things, is actually quite astounding. Um, and it turns out that uh, the complex life that we know, the complex life that we are, actually came from the mergers, early mergers of microbial life. This is something that Lynn Margulis um, really um, brought back to the scientific forefront in the 1960s in a paper that she wrote um, in the Journal of Theoretical Biology, where she basically argued a view that I think has been mostly borne out, um, that the evolution of sort of the animals, fungi, and plants, the nature we know down there at the bottom of this, of this graph, um, is rooted in the mergers of, back, of microbial life back in deep time. That the first merger was between an archaean and a bacteria, two single cell forms of life that came together a couple million years ago to form the first um, ancestor of what would then become the ancestor of animals and fungi, uh, well, and plants. Uh, and in that second merger, Another bacteria, an oxygen-breathing bacteria, was added. It was essentially engulfed by an early, that first merger and incorporated without killing it. It sort of became part of this new, um, this new organism. Um, and that second merger basically delivered what we know of as mitochondria to the, to the, dean, to, to, to the scheme. Those are the powerhouses that run all your cells. The third merger shown there about some 900 million years ago added... Um, a photosynthetic bacteria, um, the ancestor of what is now the chloroplast, the thing that actually fixes carbon for plants. Um, and so you can see the evolution of the nature that we know actually came through various mergers to create symbiotic partnerships between once free-living bacteria that teamed up to create the more complex world of life. Uh, this is something that um, you know, we found f fairly astounding, but it's fairly abstract. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very neat. Um, the return of life to our yard uh, was, was very uh, important and revealed sort of fundamental truths to us about the role of microbial life in supporting the life we know above ground. But along the way, we came in for another surprise. Um, about the time that uh, we were really convinced of the role of microbial life in supporting plants in our yard, Anne got a terrible surprise. She was diagnosed with cancer. Fortunately, it's behind her. Uh, she was diagnosed early um, and treated very effectively. Um, and now, years, several years uh, later on, she's doing OK. Um, but much to our surprise, it was a microbially generated cancer. There are some cancers that are caused by viruses. Uh, she had one that was probably rooted in a, in a virus. Um, and this got us really thinking about, well, what are, what's the role? I mean, a cancer diagnosis motivates you to think about your health. It motivates you to think about the human immune system. It motivates you to rethink your diet. All these things went into a mix uh, in our lives when it got turned upside down by this, by this out of the blue diagnosis. Um, but it also made us start looking into what's the role of microbial life in human health? Uh, we know about sort of colds and the downside, uh, but at about the same time that, um, that we're going through this, the Human Microbiome Project was essentially revealing that the genetic diversity in our microbial life greatly outweighs the diversity in our own genes, that the, the genes in the human microbiome outnumber those in the human genome by about 700 to 1 or something. Um, you know, those numbers probably aren't very precise, uh, but the point is, is that we started to realize just how much of our own bodies is actually integrated with and related to the microbial life within our bodies. And there's been an explosion of microbiome research over the last couple decades, um, and the last decade in particular, that's really revealed strong connections between microbial life, soil fertility, and human health. Um, and as we started looking into that literature, we started to really see microbes in a whole different way in terms of the way they interact with our own health. Um, in particular, we were surprised to discover that um, the human body has within it something like 100 trillion microbes, most of which live in our colon. Both of those facts to us were quite surprising. The idea that there were as many microbes living within us as there are stars in the galaxy in which we live was really kind of mind-stretching. <laughs> um, but the idea that most of those microbes were living in the, in the colon was really 
that was kind of a surprise. We hadn't thought much about our colons, to be frank, um, and quite happily so, I guess, for, for many years. Um, but we were also surprised to discover in looking into the human immune system and, and what we could do to bolster the immune system, in part because of Anne's um, diagnosis. Um, we were surprised to discover that 80% of the human uh, immune system or human immune cells is associated with the gut, with the colon in particular. Um, and that figure that shows you that, uh, if, uh, um, it's up on the screen now, sort of shows you the, the cutaway blow up of the human colon. And that, that if you look at the big slice there, um, you notice that there's a few things called out. There's a mucus layer, um, that you have, and there's a thing called the galt and the colon crypt. So I'll go sort of go through what each of those are. That mucus is essentially um, mucus that the goblet cells produce. That um, it's a it's a sugary, it's a carbohydrate rich substance uh, that bacteria in your colon wall and lining eat. Now your colon is not just exuding mucus to feed those microbes, it also keeps things moving along in a way you'd like to keep them moving along through that particular piece of anatomy. Um, but it also feeds microbes. Um, and we started thinking, wow, you know, is that what, what plants are doing? Is that like an exudate? And it turns out that that thing called the galt over there is the gut-associated lymphatic tissue, is that part of the colon in which um, an awful lot of your immune cells reside. So a lot of your immune cells are sort of sitting just on the other side of that, mi of that mucosal lining of the colon. And if you look down into the colon crypts, there's still a lot of research that's going on on this in terms of sort of what's living in there in terms of microbes that are in there. Um, but the thinking is that there are some microbes that are actually inhabiting these deep recessions in the colon wall, those, those vertical crypts that if you look at um, in a micrograph, look a lot like this, where on the left what you see is essentially a healthy colon lining with divided into little segments of which there's a pit right down in the middle. And you'd have to be very small to fall into those pits. You'll notice that the scale bar across the bottom there is a tenth of a millimeter. Now, if you're a microbe, that's still a huge hole. You, you can like drop right down it. But um, if you're a millimeter-sized person, you could sort of span it with a, with a leg span. Um, and if you take each one of those crypts and you sort of pull it out and isolate it, what you find is it's essentially a tube. It's a little gland that is essentially a singular tube, and they're all stuck together to form the lining of the colon. Um, and what do they do? Well, I think that the, the, we're still, I think microbiologists, again, and I are a geologist and a biologist, so we're not discovering any of this stuff. We're just reading other people's stuff and learning it. But what I think is still being discovered is essentially what role do those crypts play and which microbes are actually living in them. But it's, it's a reasonable idea to think that um, they're not there to support pathogens. Um, there are areas where your body is actually exuding carbohydrates in what could be ideal microbial habitat. Um, odds are, I think, that um, there's something else going on. And if we think about what that might be, if you think back to that GALT, that gut-associated lymphatic tissue that's just on the other side of the lining of the colon, um, it's populated by a lot of immune cells, in particular dendritic cells. And what do they do? Well, they collect antigen. And what's antigen? Well, it's a microbial sample of essentially, it's a, like a piece of a microbe. You could think of it as taking a little piece out of a microbe. Um, and dendritic cells are very odd cells. They're kind of like, everybody remember the movie The Blob? Where you know, it can like ooze out in different directions, sort of like a giant amoeba. Well, dendritic cells are like that. They're the one cell that actually can extend an arm through the lining of your colon, in bet squeezing it in between cells, and it goes up into, your, into the lumen, which is what we call the interior of your colon, um, and into the mucosal lining of the colon. And actually, it you know, extends it out like a periscope, but it's a periscope with a, with a grabber on the end. And it can actually grab a sample of whatever microbes are living in those environments and take that antigen, that microbial sample, and pull it back down into your body. Well, why would it do that? That's a fairly strange thing for some cell to do. Well, it turns out that it does that to go show it to your other immune cells. You could think of your, of your um, dendritic cells as prospectors that are going out and actually looking for what is actually in your gut. And it takes those, that antigen sample and it brings it back to show to other immune cells, in particular uh, T cells. Um, and T cells are an interesting kind of cell. 
that has a particular receptors that are on it. That's shown in that, that slide as a T cell receptor. And each T cell receptor is, is unique. It's matched, it has a, it's kind of like a, um, uh, a hand that has a, a perfect counterpart and that when, the, to give you the, the perfect handshake or the lines up or the identical the mirror image hand, I'm not sure what the best analogy is, but you get the point. It's, it's a unique, um, it's a unique receptor that matches a particular compound. And so when a, when a dendritic cell brings back an antigen that does not match that compound, the T cell kind of ignores it. When, it. when the T cell brings back an antigen that is perfectly fit to its receptor, it basically, it activates. It basically turns into the kind of T cell that, that I'll be talking about. Well, it basically does things. Um, and so the dendritic cells are prospecting for the microbes that are living in your, in your colon, bringing samples back in, showing it to other cells in your immune system, and what do they do with that? Well, T cells are activated by, that, by the antigen the dendritic cells bring back, and what T cells are, they're immune cells that either promote or quell inflammation, and they also kill infected cells. But there's different kinds of T cells. Some of them promote inflammation, some of them combat inflammation or quell inflammation. And um, as was mentioned on the panel last night, inflammation is not necessarily a bad thing. You need it to heal. If you cut your finger, you want inflammation to come in and start helping to repair those tissues. But too much inflammation, chronic inflammation in particular, is incredibly bad and can lead to many of the kinds of chronic illnesses that you've probably been talking about this week. Um, and it turns out that T cells act in a way as a regulatory system that can dial that up and dial that down. If you look at the, the, the image on the right, it basically illustrates how there's different kinds of dendritic cells sampling different kinds of mic microbes and bring back different kinds of antigen to your immune system can activate different kinds of T cells. Some of the T cells, like the T regs shown there, over there on the right, serve anti-inflammatory purposes. They essentially can, if, you, if your dendritic cells are bringing back antigen that is um, uh, activating T cells that Quell inflammation is going to be putting a damper on inflammation. On the other hand, if your T cells, like the one on the left, are bringing back uh, antigen that activate uh, Th17 cells that are pro-inflammatory, um, then essentially inflammation can be, can be kicked on and amplified. In other words, you could think of your T cells in terms of the, which ones are being activated as a teeter-totter balance that essentially is, is intended to maintain an optimum level. Well, optimum is kind of the wrong motivation to put on a system like this, but that would maintain a balance of, of inflammation, calling it in when you need it and quelling it when you don't, essentially maintaining a healthy balance of inflammation in your body. Um, and the realization that microbes communicate the information essential for the smooth operation of the immune system through that dendritic cell sampling of antigen and activation of different kinds of T cells, the idea that those microbes are essential for controlling the level of inflammation in your body, gave to Ann and I, at least, when we sort of looked into the research behind this, sort of a whole new way of looking at microbes in our body. Um, you know, maybe they're actually essential for health in ways that we hadn't thought about. And why hadn't we thought about that? Well, like probably just about everyone else in America, we would have been steeped in germ theory for most of our lives. The idea that microbes are germs, that they're bad, that they, you know, they're out to get you, they could, they could harm you, they could kill you. Um, this is thinking that goes back to the 19th century when it was you know, well discovered that particular microbes were indeed responsible for particular diseases. Um, and if you look back at the causes of mortality back, say, in the 17th century, this may be a, a bit uh, blurry to read there, but if you go through and read sort of all those causes of mortality for, from one of the bills of mortality in London in the 17th century, uh, you'll notice that an awful lot of those things that took people out were microbially generated, fevers, plague. Um, there's other things like uh, the king's evil. I don't know what that was, but the only one person died of it, apparently. Um, you look at the big numbers on there, and it's essentially microbial stuff. There's no doubt that you know, many microbes were, this, or were pathogens. Um, there's something, something like 1,400 different human pathogens, but there's millions of different kinds of microbes in the human microbiome. Smallpox and polio in particular are two examples of things that, um, of microbial maladies that afflicted both the rich and poor alike until the development of vaccines. Um, 
we, we go into sort of the history of that kind of thinking in the book. I I'll, I'll, won't go into that today in the interest of time. But over the course of the 20th century, we saw a very large change in the causes of death in the, in, uh, the United States. Back in 1900, infectious diseases were taken out about 53% of the people who died. Um, chronic diseases accounted for just uh, about a third, 36% or so. By 2011, that had really flipped. Infectious diseases were down to about 3% of deaths, and chronic diseases were related to you know, 88%, almost 90% um, of the people who died or uh, it was associated with chronic diseases. Now, of course, there's a, a number of, of explanations for this, not the least of which is the development and wide use of antibiotics in the 20th century really helped reduce the rates of infectious diseases. Medical practice advanced greatly as well. Sanitation and public health advanced greatly. There's a lot of reasons why the sort of the, the deaths from infectious diseases went down over the 20th century. What that doesn't explain though, is what about the rise of chronic diseases in the latter half of the 20th century? This graph shows essentially the decline of infectious diseases over the, on the left-hand side between 1950 and 2000, or um, they're all sort of going down for the, many of the reasons that I was just talking about. Um, but on the right-hand side, it's the incidence of chronic diseases. There was rising from the 1950s to the 2000s, different ones rose at different paces, and you could throw some more on here if you went out and found the studies. Um, but the question is, what actually sort of led to the rise of chronic diseases? And again, I'm a geologist, so don't take any particular medical advice out of this talk at all, other than with the weighting of, yeah, it's from a geologist and a biologist. Um, but one of the things that happened in the 20th century, of course, that we all know about is the rise of antibiotic resistance. Um, you know, the use of antibiotics actually right, changed not only the, micro, the microflora within our bodies, but it changed them in way other, in, they adapted to it. It, you know, it took about, what the, each of those bars show is the time between the introduction of an antibiotic onto the market and the, the first reported rise of incidences of uh, antibiotic resistance. And you notice we've gone through a fair number of antibiotics since the first introduction of penicillin in the 1940s, but you look at the time scales and you're talking a couple years to a couple decades. In other words, it, it doesn't take microbes all that long to adapt to the new ways that we developed for killing them. And it turns out that that's rooted at some level in two things. One, they have an incredibly short generational turnover time on the order of 20 minutes. So as, we've, as I've been talking, they've turned over a few times. <laughs> um, and they also have a lot of genetic plasticity. It turns out they can actually trade genes the way we trade stories and handshakes. They don't have to reproduce to modify themselves genetically. It's called horizontal gene transfer. Um, and it's, if you take essentially those two things, something with the ability to, to share genetic information and with an incredibly short generational turnover time, the idea that we will win a genetic arms race with them starts to sound kind of silly. Um, and that's basically what's been happening with antibiotic resistance and it's one of the main reasons why the over-application of antibiotics in both medicine and agriculture is not in society's best interest. Now, it can be in our own personal best interest if we need them for a particular malady at the moment, but it's in all our best interest to preserve their ability to work for future generations as well. Well, so, so the rise of antibiotics and their use and overuse in medicine and agriculture is probably one of the things that was going on. Um, and another one is essentially the changing nature of the diet of... Um, in the Western world, and particularly in North America, over the course of the 20th century. And this is our sort of attempt to ca ca capture that in a single graph, where it shows you carbohydrate consumption from 1910 to 1997, uh, and the way that that's actually changed. So if you look at the early part of the century, we, we tended to eat a high-carb, high-fiber diet. It was rich in whole grains, unprocessed foods, um, and over the course, you know, right about the time of the Second World War, from um, uh, meat consumption, protein consumption went up. We started to eat a lower carb, low fiber diet. Um, and most recently, since the 1970s, 80s, you can put the line where you want to put it, uh, we've essentially transitioned to uh, what is for most people a high carb, low fiber diet. Um, in the sense that we're getting a lot of calories from uh, simple carbohydrates and sugars that we were not consuming in the same quantity early on, and we're not eating anywhere near as much dietary fiber as we, as we used to. Um, why would this kind of change actually matter to our microbiome and to our own health? Well, to look at that, we ought to look at essentially the human digestive tract as a series of, um, as, a, as a system or as a sequence of ecosystems. 
And if we look at that, we can essentially divide uh, the, our digestive tract into the stomach, the small intestine, and the colon. Uh, and if you look at the life that's living within there, in the stomach, you know, in terms of bacteria per milliliter, there's not many. There's that one that was mentioned last night, Heliobacter pylori, um, that can tolerate the acid of the stomach. But the stomach's job in the digestive system is to dissolve things. There's not a lot of life that's living in there. Um, the small intestine, you get a lot more microbial life in it. Its job is to absorb things that were dissolved in the stomach. That's where a lot of the, um, the products of the digestion of simple sugars and proteins comes out. Um, and simple sugars are uh, you know, what we tend to call as sugar, simple carbohydrates, short chain carbohydrates, uh, tend to come out in the small intestine and are absorbed right into the bloodstream. It's the colon that has most of the, the life in the digestive tract. You know, 10 to the 11th bacteria per milliliter. That's a lot. Anything with 11 zeros after it is a lot. Um, and what happens in the colon? Well, it turns out that it, you can think of it as a fermentation tank. A lot of the, the materials that we don't digest, that don't get dissolved in the stomach or absorbed in the small intestine, end up in the colon. Um, and that's the stuff that essentially feeds the microbial life in the colon. And what is it that the microbial life in the colon is essentially uh, adapted to, to process? What do they live on? Well, that's where that fiber part of the diet comes in. Because we can't break down dietary fiber ourselves. We need microbial assistance to do that. Um, and this is a micrograph, colored micrograph of bacteria uh, breaking down a piece of fiber. Um, you know, your gut microflora in the colon, you know, love to digest fiber. That's a key part of what they consume. And it turns out that that's a key part of why their consumption generates things that help you in terms of your health. Um, this graph uh, from a recent paper, uh, not, not one of ours, uh, shows essentially, is a very nice illustration that shows how um, that process works. If you start up in the upper left-hand corner, we're going to sort of go around clockwise on the, on the figure. Fiber that makes it all the way to your colon, dietary fiber, the stuff that's indigestible to you with your own genome, um, whether it's starch or cellulose, you know, plant, and what is that stuff? It's plant matter. It's plant foods. Um, that stuff, your microbiota breaks down and, and transforms it into fatty acid metabolites, things like acetate, butyrate, and propionate, um, that serve functions within your colon, and among others, keeping it from, develop, from becoming leaky. Um, but those, those fatty acid metabolites essentially activate receptors on T cells that quell inflammation. So if you, if you track and follow that around, with, if you have a, if you're eating enough fiber to support the microbiota that's generating enough of those fatty acids to trigger the T cells that are T regs that generate IL-10 and inter interleukin-10 that acts as an inflammatory response blocker. Um, that's a way to essentially maintain the health and integrity of your colon lining. Um, in other words, it's the things that the microbes in your gut are breaking down and turning them into that your body is using to maintain your health. Now again, uh, I'm a rock doctor, I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm not gonna advise, uh, give you any particular advice on any of these particular maladies. But I can read the scientific literature. Anne's a biologist, she's worked in public health. We read this together and essentially look at, there's a large list of maladies that researchers have started to associate with an altered microbiome. In terms of which of the connections to which of these particular maladies is causal and which is just associative, I think we're still work that researchers are still working a lot of that out and, and we're the wrong people to give you specific advice on any of those. And e yet even if we were, our understanding of the community composition of the microbes in our gut is in its infancy. We're just starting, researchers are just starting to figure out who's living where. Like who's living in those crypts in the colon? What are they doing there? How important is it that there's particular species or particular communities of species? And how do you change those? How do you alter them? How do you support their, their activity and health? We're still at the days of, of really trying, of just discovering that this stuff matters. And that's why we wrote the book uh, in terms of looking at the hidden half of nature, because we think that if you look out 20, 30, 40 years, the worlds of medicine and agriculture are gonna be different because of the way people are discovering now how these microbial connections work.
So if you look, I'll just give you a couple examples. One, um, again, taken from the literature, uh, the difference between a, a symbiosis or sort of a healthy relationship with your microbiome and dysbiosis, an unhealthy one, is captured in these two slides of looking at um, um, uh, Clostridium difficile, C. difficile, um, that uh, can create uh, chronic diarrhea and, and, and be a major problem for some people. In a healthy gut, uh, C. difficile is present in small numbers, and it's the diversity and abundance of other microbes that keep it in check. It's the community composition that keeps it in check. You could think about that sort of the same way uh, that what happened to deer in North America. As long as there were a lot of predators for the deer around, the deer population was kept under control. And what happened when we took the wolves and the coyotes and the things, well, do coyotes go for deer? The, the predators that actually um, took deer out in the past, when you take them out, the deer population explodes and they can become actually a nuisance. Well, the same thing can happen with microbes because after antibiotic uh, treatments, C. difficile can, um, if you wipe out your normal gut flora, and if it's the C. difficile that recolonizes first, it can actually lead to long-term problems um, and, and infections that over the course of the last couple decades have actually been uh, growing quite, quite dramatically in terms of the numbers of deaths per million people. Um, you know, it's a small number of people affected, but the antibiotic treatments haven't been working too well for this. Um, and there's been many uh, un untreatable C. difficile infections. What has actually worked? Fecal transplants. The idea of actually transplanting fecal matter from a person with a healthy microbiome into someone with C. difficile infection, it's actually resulted in something like 90% cure rates in clinical trials. In fact, cl some clinical trials were terminated early because most of the patients receiving the treatment were being cured, whereas the ones that were not receiving the treatment were continuing to have major problems. Um, what this illustrates, I think, is the power of thinking in terms of microbial applications as medical applications and how to manipulate our own microbiome in ways that actually enhance uh, our practices, both in medicine, and I'll talk a bit more uh, about in a minute, in terms of agriculture. So what does this stuff all really mean for us? Well, what Ann and I came to realize when we were started looking at these parallels between the world of the microbiome in soil and the world of the microbiome in the human gut is that you can really think of the root and the gut as the same kind of system inside out. And of course there's differences. We're talking about plants and people here, right? There's differences. But if you think at the sort of the 30,000 foot level in terms of what's going on in terms of our relationships with our mi microbes and our microbiome, um, if you look at roots, the exudates feed the um, beneficial microbes. In the gut, mucus is feeding beneficial microbes, we think, um, on, the, on the gut lining. Um, in the roots, microbes acquire nutrients for plants and trade them um, uh, with plants, they also make critical metabolites that they trade with plants, and it turns out that microbes in your gut are also making critical metabolites that help promote your health. Microbes are uh, a key element in communication and plant defense. They're also a key element in communication and teeing up your immune system response, your own defense system. Um, and if you think of the root in plants as, you can think of it as an external digestive system for the plants. It's an external rumen, you know, a, a, a cow has a rumen that is a fermenta fermentation tank that breaks down uh, organic matter, the grass that it eats. Cows don't actually digest the grass, the microbes in their rumen do. You can think of the rhizosphere as an external rumen for plants. It's an external digestive system that takes that organic matter, all that organic matter Anne was adding to our yard was being digested outside the plant roots and then taken up. It's an external stomach. In us, it's the colon that serves that purpose. We take the plant matter inside us, um, where the fiber is fermented to make those critical metabolites. So if we look at the parallels between the root system and the gut system, we actually start realizing, oh, maybe one of the fundamental organizing principles of health in both plants and people is constructive, healthy symbioses with the microbial life that we didn't even know about until a couple centuries ago, and then we didn't expect, we didn't even think had these kind of effects until researchers starting putting this story together over the last couple decades. Well, what does this mean? Well, we're still in the early days of understanding all this stuff, but I think already some key implications are clear from this new perspective. You know, we, we're not going to be able to rely on broad spectrum biocides, things that sort of blanketly kill microbes indiscriminately as our go to solutions for problems in agriculture and medicine if most of the microbes out there are actually either beneficial to us or do no harm. If we tailor our strategy to take out 
just a cup, you know, the, the 1,400 or so pathogens out of the millions of different kinds of microbes that surround us and, and they're in us, um, you know, that's really using the wrong tool for the job because we're taking out a lot of our allies at the same time that we're taking out our enemies. Now, this is not to belittle the progress that antibiotics made in the 20th century at curing infectious diseases. I'm happy that, I'm, you know, that we have those tools in our quiver. But I'd like to see those tools preserved for the, to be able to help benefit future generations as well. And that the practice of the, broad, the application of broad spectrum biocides will forego that as microbes adapt. We need different strategies. So we need to think, I think, in terms of probiotics, antibiotics, prebiotics. Um, um, we talk about the use of probiotics in the book as, as medical applications. There are some applications that really uh, do seem to work. Um, we need to sort of rethink the application and over-application of antibiotics in both agriculture and medicine. Use them when we need them, but maybe not when we don't. Um, but there's also the issue of prebiotics, a term that I, didn't, I hadn't heard about when we started doing the research for this book, but which actually now has totally changed the way that Ann and I eat. What are prebiotics? Well, it's basically the stuff that provides the fiber to your colon. It's the stuff that basically, it's like this stuff. It's, it's plant matter. It's, it's, it's green stuff. It's, it's um, cellulose and, and fiber-rich material, it's basically eating for your microbiome, for the microbiome in your gut, because that's where most of your microbiome is. Uh, they like plant matter, so that means greens and fiber-rich vegetables and fruits are essentially you know, the thing we should be ensuring we eat enough of to feed them. We're not necessarily eating that for us, we're eating it to feed them so they can work with us. We're feeding our microbial partners. What would this look like on your plate? Well, um, you know, essentially, eating a lot of vegetables and fruits, leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables. Um, you know, fill your plate at least half full with those kind of things. And unprocessed whole grains um, would be the, the other key. Uh, some source of protein. Uh, suit yourself in terms of how you want to find it, but the key thing here is not to actually have that be the bulk of your diet. You want to be essentially have that to be a much smaller share of the diet than is typical in the Western diet uh, because you want a lot more of that stuff in that green side of the plate. And why does this matter? How would this work? Well, if you can kind of compare the typical Western diet to what we like to call the inner garden diet, the sort of that, that plate that we just showed, um, there's some, some real differences. If you think down through the system of the digestive tract, uh, what's happening and coming out, those black arrows are essentially showing you the relative amounts of things coming from those different colored boxes. Uh, in the Western diet, we get a lot of simple carbohydrates. That's those, those um, refined grains, simple sugars, things that are absorbed in your small intestine, go straight into your bloodstream, cause insulin problems, uh, all kinds of issues I think we'll hear a lot more about, um, or you'll hear a lot more about later um, this week. Um, in terms, you also get very few of, of the medicinal microbial metabolites in the Western diet. Why? If you don't have enough fiber going down into your colon, you're not feeding the microbiome in there that would then be producing those. In the inner garden diet, I mean, you want to eat carbohydrates, and some simple carbohydrates are fine, but you want to make sure you're basically eating in a way that produces enough of the medicinal microbial metabolites in your colon to actually sustain and foster your own health. And what are those harmful microbial metabolites in the middle? Well. Uh, we heard again, I think last night, some allusion to the breakdown of proteins producing a lot in terms of sulfur and nitrogen-rich compounds, and that's, that's true. Um, the key is that you do need sulfur and nitrogen, though, for your own health. You just don't need as much as we tend to eat. Um, and so you want to outweigh the things that may be harmful metabolites from the breakdown and processing of your food with things that are helpful ones. Um, in other words, eat a plant-rich diet. But plants have a diet, too. And this, this microbial perspective on health and nutrition relates to that as well. Um, if you look at what plants produce themselves and integrate into their bodies, sort of take that last graph and turn it sort of back the other way around, what happens in terms of sort of the typical Western fertilizer diet in terms of where we're basically feeding the plants as much nitrogen and phosphorus as they can possibly take up. And it, they, get a lot of micro, they get a lot of macronutrients. They're getting the basic things they need to build their bodies. But what they don't get is that the, the microbial life in the soil isn't working as hard to actually bring them micronutrients, to actually generate the phytochemicals that they need to defend pathogens. Um, and so you're getting fewer, the fewer of the beneficial microbial metabolites and fewer of the micronutrients. And so if you have a a soil life diet where essentially the plants are relying more on the microbial processes and breakdown of organic matter and the recycling of material within the soil to generate their own bodies and nutrition, um, you get 
more of the beneficial um, compounds, these phytochemicals, you get um, more micronutrients, um, and you get perhaps some less micro, uh, macronutrients, um, and there's all kinds of studies all over the place in terms of what this may do to crop yields. Um, but the difference in terms of microbial life, in terms of what's actually making it into, the, into plants, is, I think, um, in principle at least, fairly clear. And soil health, in the end, does translate into our own health. If we look at the, uh, there's a UK Ministry of Health study back uh, that looked at mineral depletion in vegetables from 1940 to 1991. They found, you know, across the board decreases in, you know, copper, calcium, iron, magnesium, potassium, different mineral elements. And there's a lot of reasons that people offer for this. Different crop varieties, um, uh, intensive fertilization, um, but the key thing, it, you know, it may be that this changes in microbial life in the soil have played a role in that as well. The key thing, though, is their quote there, deficiencies in plants translate through to deficiencies in animals. A piece of steak now contains only half the amount of iron it would have contained 50 years ago. You make the same kind of statements about uh, vegetables in terms of their, their mineral contents. Things, and we need micronutrients. We don't need a lot of them. That's why they're called micronutrients. But they are actually very critical to maintaining our own health. And it turns out that microbial life in the soil is one of the, the vectors through which that stuff gets into us. So in other words, what I've been trying to get across is that understanding the hidden half of nature, the, the microbial world, the world below our feet and the world too small to see, is actually unveiling a new view of nature and ourselves. We're starting to think about ourselves in a different way because of these microbial partnerships that actually turn out to be essential to maintaining our own health. What does it mean? Well, we need, frankly, we need to cultivate our soil, both inner and outer, the soil in the garden and the soil in our gut, with organic matter. We have to feed the microbes that, are, that serve beneficial purposes towards our own health or the health of our crops. And how would we do this? Well, again, you've got a geologist and a biologist um, talking to you about this, so we're not going to give you specific details on specific um, things. But in the broad principle, we need to use the mind of an ecologist with the care of a doc gardener and the skill of a doctor to actually try and bring together our understanding of how to foster the beneficial life both within the soil and within ourselves um, because they really have been our secret silent partners for, for most of our evolutionary history. And I'll leave you there. I actually sent the page proofs of the book off the day before I got in the plane to come here, so you guys are the beta testers. You're hearing this first. Um, but I obviously encourage you to check the book out. It'll be out in the fall. Thank you. And I, and I guess we have time for a question or two, but I'll be glad to enter entertain most questions uh, afterwards out there when I get a chance to catch my breath. I, I live in a community here in Florida uh -huh. that uh, I moved from Edmonds, Washington to ah. the community. Uh, and they're very restrictive about what we're allowed to do with our yards. And when we first moved in, we started composting. They made us tear out our compost pile and throw away the compost drum. Uh, we have earthworms, but we had to put up a six-foot fence in order to keep our neighbors from seeing that we have earthworms. Uh, we, planted, uh, we planted papayas along the back fence, but they aren't on the list that's approved in the town, so they made us tear out the papayas. Uh, we put sweet potatoes or wild yams in our front garden, and they made us tear out our, our, our yams. Uh, the upshot you should plant is they, in the backyard. Well, we... <laughs> We would, but it's the shady part. And oh. Our neighbor's tree covers the backyard, so it's very difficult to plant things that will grow well in the backyard. And, and then to top it off, they put a $20,000 fine on us for planting the wrong kinds of vegetables and, and basically being the leaders of the rebel alliance in the town. So my suggestion is that this video that we're creating here be shown to the homeowners associations uh, all over the country so that they can see... <laughs> That some of us who are trying to change the urban environment into permaculture are not really villains, but are yeah. in fact part of the solution and start of, instead of part of the problem. Yeah, I would, I would agree very much with that. Um, the, if we look at how we shape our own habitat, our, which is for most of humanity, it's mostly the urban environments now. More than half of us live in urban environments. We should be thinking about restoring the soil uh, in urban environments, not just to make gardens, but in terms of connections to food 
Uh, the part I didn't talk about in the talk today is how much food Anne has been able to grow in her vegetable beds in our yard at different times. Um, there's been times when, during the summer, we mostly are eating out of there. And, you know, it's as close as you can get to fresh if it's coming right out of the backyard. And, uh, you know, I don't understand the, Ed was it Edmonds, was it? Um, no, no, that's here in Celebration. Oh, that's here. Oh, yeah, you know, I just don't get that. I just don't get it. I mean, that's... Yes. I, I just want to thank you for this fascinating. I'm just amazed by this, by these invisible to the human eye microbes and the key. They they play a role in everything in the source of life, the wisdom of nature. The this the it, it's just amazing to me. But and also it just it just brings to light that we as humans we we our our perspective is just to control and and. Cool. And I ultimately destroy the, all this wisdom, and it just points it out that we need to learn from the wisdom of nature, yeah, the natural one, processes. One of the things I've been most interested in uh, with this whole, with writing this book, was just how different the perspective that we have today, at, sorry, at, the, at, so at the leading edge of science, at the, for, the frontiers of both agriculture and medicine, um, the perspective that we have today on microbial life is different than we had 20, 30 years ago. That's truly a revolution in thought. It hasn't played out yet. And I would argue to you that we've got opportunities to both um, really mess things up and to really make things better. And you know, the challenge is going to be to try and think of how to develop methods and techniques to use this new perspective and understanding for the better. Because there's also you know, the law of unintended consequences. We, we have a long track record of trying to do what we think is the right thing and then going, oops when something goes sideways on us. That'll happen. Um, but I think the important part is to essentially keep exploring and trying to make things better. Um, and I'm, I'm working on a new book now looking at, at the role of soil restoration in agriculture. I think we can actually reform, it is possible to reform agriculture and feed the world this century in ways that are constructive. Um, and the important thing is for people to be thinking uh, in with the current best available science to try and guide practices uh, in a constructive direction. Anyway, I'll, be, I'll be glad to, take, uh, to entertain other questions out um, uh, in, the, in the lobby. Thank you very much.